Well, hello. I can see I've got no live joiners for today's first Zoom session for Anatomy 120. I did this morning for uh, 110 uh, acoustics. But well, at any rate, this being our first session, allow me to just give an overview of the course in 120 Anatomy, give you a bit of a road map as to where we are going with this particular course, just like we did in acoustics this morning for 110. The two courses of Acoustics 110 and Anatomy 120 are very, very foundational courses for your program as in, in hearing instrument sciences at Ozarks. These two courses are like the underlying, underlining theoretical twin pillars upon which all the other courses are stacked. The courses of Acoustics 110 and Anatomy 120 are also very, very interwoven. You're going to see lots of references made from one course to the other, which is why I'm really glad that I'm involved in teaching both of these courses because I can try and relate concepts that, that are like bridges between these two courses throughout the semester. So each Zoom session like this, like they are in 110, will be held as about one hour length. So right now it's 1.30 Pacific time. It's probably 3.30 Central time in Springfield, Missouri. At any rate, we will, uh, the 110 course usually takes place at 11.30 uh, Central time. This one here at 3.30 Central time. Either way, the Zoom sessions are always recorded. And then I save them as YouTube segments. Takes about an hour to do that, though. So right after I record the Zoom sessions, they're not necessarily poof right there on Canvas. It takes a while for Zoom to finish its, I don't know, processing of the recording. Then I have to go into YouTube, upload them into YouTube so that they can be saved as YouTubes. That takes about a half an hour to 40 minutes. And then once that's finished, then I can upload the YouTube as a link in Canvas. So to access any of the Zoom sessions, you're going to go into Canvas, you're going to choose your course, you're going to go on the dashboard, choose your course. In this case, it's 120. Click on that dashboard course. Up, you will see uh, two boxes, Home and Coursework. You click on coursework, you should see eight circles. Each circle is a unit. So you, this is going to be unit one, overview of the ear. And then you're going to go into overview of the ear, and you will see, as you read down, you're going to see two things at the bottom of the page. One is notes. The other one is corresponding PowerPoint to those notes. In each Zoom session, I encourage you strongly to print up your notes before the Zoom session begins. <clears throat> that way, you've got your set of notes like this, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can follow along. Okay? You can jot down things with a pen or pencil on the side while we're talking. And then what I will be showing you on the screen is the actual PowerPoint that you, you will see in your Canvas too. So you've got the notes and corresponding PowerPoint in each unit. <clears throat> print up the notes. Don't print up the PowerPoint. Save trees. Because the PowerPoints I will be showing you during the Zoom sessions will be bouncing back from sharing screen to showing to talk, going over the notes. Back to sharing screen, going over the notes. As in 110, 90% of your course material required to pass your quizzes midterm and final exam, 90% of that material is in these Zoom sessions. So these Zoom sessions are very important to watch. No one's watching right now, but I'm recording. So here goes, okay? <clears throat> and as I said in 110, never watch a Zoom session over or through your cell phone. Cell phones are too small. Sorry, got to sit in front of an old-fashioned laptop or desktop computer with a monitor that's big enough so you can see 
the intricate drawings in anatomy. There's lots of small pieces and parts. So we need to get a hold of a grip. You need to get a grip of these, and you can't see that on a two inch by two inch screen. Okay. Second thing is gotta watch the Zoom sessions, or you're gonna have a real problem passing the course. I've had students halfway through the course going, oh, do we have to watch those? Uh, yeah, duh. Okay, you will. Okay. Don't wait for ages and ages to do it either, because then we fall behind. So I upload, everything is done within 24 hours. When I give the session, within several hours, I've already got it up into Canvas. So try and at your earliest convenience, watch these things. They take an hour long. You can stop them, pause them, whatever you like, but by gum, watch them, okay? Jot down notes. It's the notes and corresponding PowerPoints. And then, of course, in the unit, you will also see the link for the Zoom session. So there's three things in each unit. The notes, the PowerPoint, and the link to the uploaded YouTube Zoom session. All right, cool. Share screen. Go to here. Oh, let's shrink this. Let's shrink that. And here's your overview of anatomy and physiology of the ear. Now, the course is called A&P, Anatomy and Physiology. What the Sam Hill is the difference? Well, anatomy is the form. Anatomy is what it is. Physiology is the function. Physiology is how it works. So we always divide those terms. Anatomy is the form. Physiology is the function. Anatomy is the shape. Physiology is how it works. So what we're going to do today is do unit one, overview of the entire stinking ear. Okay? Overview of the ear. Now, when you're looking at the ear, you've got several parts. The biggest and most useless part is the outer ear. We'll talk a bit about the outer ear next week. It's the largest and most useless part. So guess what? We can get through the anatomy and the physiology of the outer ear in a week. Okay? Next, we go. So that's unit two. Unit two. You see how you have a blue? is the Microsoft Word notes. The red is the corresponding PowerPoint to those notes. I try to keep it very organized so that you can keep everything clear. Probably is a good idea to print up all of your notes and put them in a binder for this course. And that way you've got them at the ready. And then you can you know, open them up when you're listening to your recorded Zoom sessions. Look at unit three, middle ear, unit three, Middle ear. Now, the middle ear is, of course, behind the eardrum. And that's the little room that houses the three smallest bones of your body, the malleus, the incus, the stapes, also known as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The largest bone in your body is your thigh bone, or femur. The smallest bones are the middle ear. Now, the middle ear is considerably more complex than the outer ear, because the outer ear is just this weird shape and your ear canal, okay? So there's nothing really happening. Well, there's a bit of stuff happening there. It's kind of cool. We'll talk about that in a bit, actually. It is kind of cool. It does stuff, okay? By the way, if you watched the Zoom session for 110 acoustics, the outer ear resonates, <laughs> resonates with the high frequencies of speech. So to understand what the Sam Hill I'm talking about here, you probably would want to watch 110 and know that. But we'll be explaining that anyway. We'll be explaining that anyway when we cover Unit 2, Outer Ear, Anatomy, Physiology. Middle ear is considerably more complex. So we'll study a week of its anatomy and another week in physiology. So outer ear, anatomy, and physiology in one week. Middle ear, Anatomy and physiology takes two weeks. Then we move to unit four, inner ear. Now notice what it says, inner ear anatomy. And then here, inner ear anatomy. But guess what? You got two weeks on inner ear anatomy. That's unit four. And then you have another two weeks on inner ear physiology. Now we'll back up a second. So, so you've got four weeks. So you got two weeks of the anatomy, 
two weeks of the physiology for a total of four weeks on the inner ear. So the outer ear, anatomy and physiology in one week. The middle ear, anatomy, physiology takes two weeks. The inner ear, anatomy, physiology takes four weeks. So we're starting to wind on down, of course, to the middle of the course. Actually, your midterm will take place after the first week of, an, of, of inner ear anatomy. So we'll cover outer ear, middle ear, and we'll be starting to delve into the inner ear anatomy. And that will be your midterm. And then after the midterm, what we'll do is we'll then go into, we'll cover, we'll finish the inner ear anatomy. We'll go into inner ear physiology, how it works. So you can see that there's a real buildup from simplicity to more complex to way more complex. The inner ear is by far the most complicated part of your ear, and it's damage there that requires hearing aids mostly. It's damage there that is the reason for the season of the Hearing Instrument Sciences program. If the inner ear was not involved in this in hearing loss, we wouldn't even probably have a program. You see, damage to the inner ear cannot be fixed medically. The only thing you can do to, for damage of the inner ear is hearing aids. And that's why we have a field. 95% of hearing loss is due to damage to the inner ear. Now, when you think about this, I'm going to stop sharing for a second so we can just look at each other. When you look at glasses, okay, these things are simple, really simple. Glasses just focus light. What's the problem with most vision? Your eyeball, okay, is too long or too short. The back of your eyeball has a thing called the retina, R-E-T-I-N-A, the retina. So light comes through the pupil of your eye, and it goes to the back of your eye, which is the retina. And when light hits the retina, the retina is a sheet, like a film, Okay, and that changes the light into electricity. And electricity is the language your brain runs on. Okay, so you're changing the light into electrical current, and then your brain can figure it out. Okay, so because light doesn't go into your brain, okay, something has to change the light into electricity because your nerves run on electricity. Now, let's look at so when, when vision loss is, occurs, the light is improperly focused. So it's not clearly focused on the retina. And so you go to the dollar store and you get glasses. I got reading glasses. These are actually from an audiologist who lives in Springfield, Missouri. She gave them to me years ago, and I still use the crap out of them. Reading glasses, okay? But I could get similar types of glasses at the, at the dollar store, Dollarama, who knows, whatever. Okay, vision loss is quite easy to fix because there's nothing wrong with the retina of the eye. What the problem lies is light getting to the retina. So you wear glasses to refocus the light and Bob's your uncle. God's in his heaven, all's well with the world, you can see. Now let's look at hearing. Hearing loss is different. With hearing loss, the inner ear is damaged. Now, the inner ear, you could say in quotes, is the retina of the ear. Okay, it changes sound into electricity. And in 95% of people, it's that is what's damaged. So it's like me going to your eyeballs and going, hey, 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 scratching your retinas. Now go ahead and wear your glasses. That's why hearing aids are called hearing aids. They help, but they can't fix 100%. And that's why you will have a course called counseling in this program, because you have to get people to realize the limitations of hearing aids so that they walk out with realistic expectations. Because hearing aids for the ear ain't like glasses for the eye. Very important to make a, distingu a distinction. When you know who you're not, you have a much better idea of who you are. Truly,
okay? We may not even get through the whole thing of uh, overview today. I'm, we may not, because I'm just introducing you to concepts that are fundamental in understanding the anatomy of the ear. The ear is so different from the eye. The eye is dealing with light that travels 186,000 miles per second. The ear is dealing with sound waves that travel 766 miles an hour. Totally different kettles of fish, okay? Hearing loss is very different from vision loss. Vision loss is easier to fix, and glasses work better for the eye than hearing aids do for the ear. The public doesn't understand that, so you are going to teach them. That's why so much of this job is explaining, teaching, explaining, laying things out, talking to your clients because you've got to get them used to wearing hearing aids. And hearing aids are very helpful, but only if the person has realistic expectations and knows the limitations. And why is that so important? Because the inner ear is the retina of the ear, in quotes, and it itself is what's damaged. Not the, there's no problem with the sound getting to the inner ear. The only person who's got trouble with sound getting to the inner ear is excess earwax in the outer ear canal, or else a middle ear infection, an earache. And that's called a conductive hearing loss because you're, there's something blocking in the conduction of sound to the inner ear, okay? And if you can fix that, then everything is good. And guess what? You can fix conductive hearing loss. Remove the wax or go on antibiotics for the ear infection and you're good again. 95% of hearing loss is sensory neural. Sensory, S-E-N-R-I, dash, neural, N-E-U-R-A-L. Sensory neural, S-N, and then hearing loss, S-N-H-L. SNHL, sensory neural hearing loss, is due to damage to the inner ear, and that's 95% of all hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss, due to problems in the outer or middle ears, is only 5% of hearing loss. And guess what? It can be fixed medically. See the, the general picture here? Let's share screen and finish what we were going to talk about today, or finish the, uh, if you look at unit six, now you're dealing with the eighth nerve, and it looks like cans, okay? The eighth nerve and central auditory nervous system, your brain. So the eighth nerve is the nerve that carries sound information from your inner ear to the brain. The eighth nerve is one of 12 pairs, 12 pairs of cranial nerves. What are cranial nerves? Inside the skull. They coming off the spinal cord that enters your, 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 the, your skull. You've got 12 pairs of nerves, okay? 12 of these. The eighth pair is the auditory nerve. It's an inch long. It's only one inch long from your cochleas, your inner ears, to that spinal cord area inside your skull. And then you're talking about the brain, your perception of sound. So, unit six, eighth nerve, and central auditory nervous system. But unit four and five is covering that real delicate topic that causes sensory neural hearing loss. That's why we spend so much time on it. So let's open up overview of the ear, and then we'll open up the PowerPoint thereof as well. So here you may want to even pause this Zoom session if you can. I think you can. And then what you want to do is print up these notes. There are one, two pages in it. There's only two pages of notes, okay? But it's really helpful if you print those puppies up. Now I'm going to shrink this again, and I'm going to, I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint slides, but I will show you as well. In the PowerPoint slides, you don't need to print up, okay? Just leave them alone and leave them on your computer. They're in Canvas. They're yours. You can access them anytime you want. Those are what I'm going to be showing when I share a screen. All right, here they are. So I'm going to click on this one, make it big. All right, here's a weird-looking black and white picture. 
Look at the very far left, the very far right here. You'll see two tuning forks making sound waves. And the sound waves are entering the outer ear canal. Your outer ear canal is about one inch long. Now, in metric, because science is all metric, okay, an inch is two and a half centimeters. What's a centimeter? Let's stop sharing here. A fingernail. Your, an average fingernail, okay? An average fingernail is about a centimeter. Two and a half of those makes about an inch. That's one good way to kind of keep a handle on what the Sam Hill a centimeter is, okay? So your ear canal is about two and a half centimeters long. Then you have your ear drum. Look at my cursor here. And then you have your three little bones. Now, the lay public calls this the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. We never will again. This is called the malleus. We'll look at it further in our notes later. The incus and the stapes. Malleus, M-A-L-L-E-U-S. Incus, I-N-C-U-S. Stapes, S-T-A-P-E-S. -E and then you've got the inner ear. So you've got the outer, middle, and see those two parts? All they are involved in is with the conduction of sound to the inner ear. It's all about the inner ear. Now, here's where the magic takes place. Because inside this inner ear here, you can see on the right-hand co corresponding cochlea, the, the inner ear, it's got all these little hairs. Those are called hair cells. And here they're showing you, the, uh, not the hair cells, but the motions taking place. Here they're showing you the, 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 the anatomy. Here they're showing you the physiology, but it doesn't matter. Okay? And then you're going to see these weird loops on the top. Those are your balance organs balance organs hearing and balance hearing and balance and then you can see this eighth nerve eighth nerve now they drew the brain really tiny here of course because we're focusing on the ear actually your brain is way bigger okay obviously but you can see the brain in the center and you can see the spinal cord going into your skull now that's called your brain stem brain stem. So you've got outer, middle ear, inner ear, eighth nerve, central auditory nervous system. All right, next slide. Here's a close-up of the ear, okay? The outer ear, one, and a, one inch long, two and a half centimeters, eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes, and here's your balance organs and your cochlea, your inner ear. They call it the cochlea, C-O-C-H-L-E-A. Cochlea means snail shell in Greek. That's why they call it cochlea, okay? And here's the eighth nerve. Now, in all actuality, back to this picture, your cochlea is drawn too large here, okay? Your cochlea is actually about the size of the tip of your little finger. Same with your eardrum. How big is your eardrum? When you would look, let's say if you looked at an eardrum, it's about as big as the end of my finger. Okay, this, this round, that's about the size of an eardrum. That's also about the size of your cochlea. Tip of your finger here, it's about the size of your cochlea. Weird, huh? Small. So when I share screen again, you will see that this picture is showing you the cochlea. It almost looks like it's about the size of an eyeball, and it's way bigger than your drum. In reality, they are about the same size. You see that? Now you're looking at a more realistic picture. Ear canal, two and a half centimeters long. Eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes cochlea and balance organs and your eighth nerve going to the brain and look at this pink area this is your middle ear space now your middle ear space is just filled with air there's no fluid in there okay it's just air 
And how does the air get in there? It communicates with the eustachian tubes. Look at what this word is, eustachian tube. That's the tubes leading. You have one on one side, one on the other, going from this middle ear and from this middle ear down to your tonsils. That's why when you blow your nose real hard, poof, you feel it in your ears. Okay, because when you yawn, when you swallow, you temporarily open those eustachian tubes for a split second and new air gets up into your middle ear space. All right, normally this eustachian tube is closed, kind of like government offices, closed and less forced open. <laughs> anyway, when you swallow or yawn or blow really hard, you open this eustachian tube for a split second, new air gets in. All right, the cochlea isn't filled with air, it's filled with fluid. The same kind of fluid that surrounds your brain and spinal cord, cerebral spinal fluid. And inside of it are thousands and thousands of tiny hair filaments called hair cells. Now, it's those hair cells that get damaged. And when hair cells are damaged, you have sensory neural hearing loss, which is permanent and cannot be medically treated. Think about it. If this is as big as your tip of your little finger, you have 15,000 hair cells in each cochlea. There's no way a scalpel can get in there to fix that. Besides, this is all buried in bone, isn't it? Can you see that? So your inner ear is really like a hole dug in the ground. It's like me saying to you, take the, go cross the street and take out that telephone pole. So you do. And then I say, okay, now I want you to give me the hole. Okay? Literally, the cochlea is like an auger-shaped drill hole into the hardest bone of your body. And the hardest bone of your body is called the petrous bone, after Peter the rock. It's the hardest bone of the body. So it's very difficult to excise a cochlea and take it out and hold it in your hand because a cochlea is literally a hole dug into the bone and filled with those hair cells and cerebral spinal fluid. So your inner ear is the retina in quotes of the ear itself and it changes sound into electricity and electrical current is sent up the eighth nerve to the brain. Far out, huh? Here's another picture of the entire ear. That's what we're just doing, is overview of the entire stinking ear. And if you're looking at now, look at the shape of the outer ear. It has a unique pieces and parts. Every ear has a little bump here, a little bowl here, a little dip over here, kind of a ring around the outside. Next week or the week, we'll be talking about the pieces and parts of the outer ear and giving them all names. So, but this is your ear canal. Sometimes they call it the external auditory meatus. Meatus, like meat with a U.S. on the end, meatus, meatus. M-E-A-T-U-S simply is the Latin word for tunnel. So external auditory meatus or ear canal, eardrum or tympanic membrane, T-M, tympanic membrane, malleus, incus, stapes, balance organs, cochlea. And now you can see that there's various chambers inside the cochlea, can't you? A couple of brown chambers and a blue one. Now the hair cells are actually inside this blue chamber here, all inside. It goes all the way around. You can even see it here, okay? Whereas, and one type of fluid and hair cells is in here, and another type of fluid is here. There's no hair cells in this area. There's none in this area. It's all in the inner area. Think of a battery. Batteries kind of have two different fluids in them, don't they? Or two different metals. And that's what creates an electrical charge. Well, in this area, the brown areas is cerebral spinal fluid. And in the blue area is exactly the opposite chemical composition. And that's what creates a charge and sends sound information up the eighth nerve 
to your brain. Can you see how the eighth nerve is attached to your balance organs as well as to your cochlea? So the eighth nerve is your auditory balance nerve. This area, the balance area, is sometimes called the vestibular system. Vest, you know, you're wearing a vest. Vestibular, V-E-S-T, I-B-U-L-A-R, vestibular system. Vestibular system, balance system. Cochlea, hearing. Vestibular, balance. And what's this tube here? The eustachian tube, going down to the tonsils. Here's yet another picture, an overview of the ear. External auditory meatus. Oh, this whole outer ear is often called the pinna, P-I-N-N-A, pinna, okay? This is the external auditory meatus, tympanic membrane, malleus, incus, stapes, vestibular system, cochlea, eighth nerve, eustachian tube. Now look at the way they draw this cochlea. You can really see the chambers. And when you look at it close, you'll see what on the previous slide, you know the brown areas here? Well, that's this area and this area, this area and this area, okay? But see the triangles? Those triangles, that's the blue area, okay? You have one type of fluid here and here, the other type of fluid in here. One type of fluid here and here. The other type of fluid there. Hmm. This is a close-up of the outer ear. When you're looking at a close-up of the outer ear canal, you can see that the skin covers cartilage and bone. Now, Look at your nose. Grab the end of your nose. You can bend the end of your nose. You can't bend the top. The skin at the top of your nose covers bone. The skin at the bottom of your nose covers cartilage. Okay? It's the same thing with your ear canal. Exactly the same thing. The skin covers cartilage on the outside, bone on the inside. That's why you can wiggle your ear. Okay, I'm wiggling the cartilaginous portion. Now, can you wiggle your ears? So only audiologists can do that. Just thought I'd tell you. It's a skill. Yeah. All right. Let's look at our uh, let's look at our notes here. I'm going to stop sharing and go straight over to ooh, I need the notes here. So where can I go? How can I do that? Let's see, I'll hit escape here. I want my notes. Where are my notes for this course, yeah? Let's see if I can shrink that. Oh yes, here we go, overview of the year. That's why I couldn't, that's why I didn't have them. Here we go. So let's read what we've got here. You can see my screen. Overview of the anatomy and physiology of the ear. Anatomy form, physiology is function, how it works. Outer ear is called your oracle or pinna. It's about the most useless part of your ear, but ear canal, external auditory meatus is about an inch long, right down two and a half centimeters. Please and thank you. Eardrum or tympanic membrane, TM, separates the outer from the middle ear. Okay, looky, looky. Here comes cookie. All right, look, there they are. It separates the outer from the middle ear. Function of the outer ear is to gather sound and it resonates with the high frequencies of speech. Now this HZ, if you're not in the acoustics class, you'll be wondering what the heck that is. If you are in the acoustics class, you'll know exactly what that is. HZ stands for Hertz. H-E-R-T-Z, as in Hertz Renicar. Okay, that represents the frequency, like it is, is it a bass, is it a mid, or a treble sound, a, a low pitch sound, or a high pitch sound, okay? Your outer ear resonates. Now, resonates, think of a wine glass at Christmas. 
like me taking my coffee cup here and resonating means means that the object is going well your outer ear resonates with high frequencies high pitches high hertzes of speech that what's in there are consonants the letters s th ch or s s h consonants now we said it in acoustics and we'll say it again here okay and i'll stop sharing so we can really highlight this point speech is made out of vowels and consonants how many vowels do you have in speech five a e i o u and sometimes y okay every word in english has a vowel try and pick out one word in english that doesn't have a vowel you can go nuts go ahead and look there's none okay so vowels are cheap you've got thousands of words and each word has a vowel and it's so five vowels have to be shared among thousands of words so vowels don't tell you much about what the word is. Consonants do. Think of it. Fin, kin, pin, sin, tin, shin. They all have in, in, but that's the k that tells you what the word is. Now, where does most sensory neural hearing loss come from? Most sensory neural hearing loss, as we said, is from the inner ear, isn't it? So if we make this picture large and you're looking at the inner ear, where's the entrance to the inner ear? Right there. When you think about the inner ear, high, high pitch hair cells are here, mid pitch hair cells are here, and low pitch hair cells are here. Most people have trouble hearing treble. Most people have difficulty, see the high pitches are represented here. These hair cells represent the high pitches. These hair cells represent the mid pitches. And hair cells at the tippy top of the cochlea represent bass, low pitch sounds. So you can see how those are kind of protected all the time. Elderly people who lose hearing tend to lose hair cells here. And so they have trouble hearing treble. And what did we say treble was in speech? The consonants, sh, s, t, k. And just like we did in acoustics, put your hand to your throat and say, mm, ah, ooh, e, and you can feel your throat vibrate. But if you say the consonants, Sh, s, t, k. This throat isn't vibrating at all. Those are all lip sounds. And lip sounds are pops and fizzes. They're high pitched. Think of what's higher in pitch. S versus u, a, e, ch. Okay? So if you think of the word church, er, er, is loud and low. Ch, 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 ch. That's the high pitches where the canaries are. And elderly people lose that hearing first. And when you can't hear the consonants, you can't hear what someone said. You hear them talking, but your complaint is young people mumble these days. Oh, young people mumble. Well, you know what? They are partly true. A lot of young people do mumble. I mean, let's face it. I'm sitting on a plane, and I can listen to this flight attendant. Please remain seated in, in your seatbelt until the captain is, <laughs> how does they say that again? Please remain seated until the captain has brought the plane to a complete stop at the terminal gate. <laughs> Why don't they just say, please remain seated until the captain has brought the, complaint, the plane to a complete stop at the terminal gate. And look out for your luggage because shift happens. Okay, just talk a little more slowly plainly especially to elderly people you don't have to talk loud let them see your face and speak a little bit slower so they can catch you 
so that as a cashier at the grocery store or wherever you're working, you make sure to let the person use his hearing aids, because these are the oldest hearing aids in the world, help to see your lips, okay? And just speak a little bit slower like this. You don't have to talk like that. Just speak a little bit slower and let the person see you. You're not gonna believe how much that helps. It's unreal. Anyway, sensory neural loss due to hair cell damage in the inner ear or cochlea. And what types of hair cells? The high pitched hair cells, good. Now you're getting it. All right. Now we'll stop. Let's see if I can get to my good old. I have to find out where the Sam Hill is. My, I can never seem to find my, uh, my. Um, what do you call it? Oh man, I got to exit full screen here. Where? Yeah, there we go. I can never seem to find my notes. Okay, here we go. So what happens if you have no outer ears? You get about a little bit of hearing loss. A few decibels, not lots. So wax doesn't cause a big hearing loss. Okay, it doesn't. What happens if you have no outer ears? You lose a bit of that high frequency resonance by which we hear the high frequencies of speech. But the most common outer ear pathology is earwax. Cerumen, they call earwax is called cerumen. And it can cause a mild blockage in the ear. Now, again, now jot this down somewhere. You have two types of hearing loss. One's conductive, and look where I'm highlighting here, conductive. The other one's called sensory neural. Conductive hearing loss is a blockage of the passage of sound through the ear. And where does that happen? In the outer and middle ears. Okay, that's the only place that it happens. The inner ear doesn't, if damage is, is there, it's called a sensory neural hearing loss. And remember what we said, that's 95% of hearing loss. Now, when you look at the middle ear, it's still not the heart and soul of hearing. Your eardrum, tympanic membrane, or eardrum, has three layers to it, three layers of skin, one from each original embryonic layer. You have three layers of skin, in endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Don't worry about it for now. But at any rate, the eardrum is the one place in the body that preserves each of those three different layers. The outer layer, ectoderm, actually in utero, forms into your skin and nervous system. The middle layer, mesoderm, forms into bones and muscle. Endoderm, the inner layer, is what forms into slimy stuff in your body your guts, your intestines, the inside of your cheeks, the inside of your nose passages, the lining of your middle ears, or anything that's slimy. Anyway, the middle ear space. The middle ear is a closed space filled with air. It's got three ossicles. Now, ossicles means bones. And there it is, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And of these three, the stapes is the smallest. And then from the middle ear, a eustachian tube goes down and connects your middle ear to space to the back of your throat, your tonsils area. The function of the middle ear is to change. Now circle this word, change or transduce. There's a word here that you will find very often in our field, transduce. And transduce means to change energy from one form into another. Now let's talk about transducing, okay? If I want to transduce, whoa, I don't want that. All right. Boy, oh boy, it's getting strange here. Okay, transduce. Transduce means to change energy from one form into another. Look what a microphone does. You're talking into a mic. A microphone is transducing sound into electricity, okay? And a speaker, that's a transducer too, because it changes electricity into sound waves. So in a way, a speaker is a backward mic. A mic is a backward speaker. A frown is an upside down smile, okay? They're just, they're two different transducers. 
And because you're hearing instrument specialists to be, we need to know what these words are. Well, your ear is a series of transducers. So when you look at what your middle ear does, and we share screen again, okay, your middle ear transduces. So here's your middle ear. It's going to change sound waves into mechanical piston-like energy. And so your, your sound waves coming in here are going to wiggle these bones. And the little bones are going to be vibrating. And this little stapes bone is, going to, is, is just like a little piston pushing in and out. And it's wiggling fluid in this cochlea. And the wiggling of fluid is picked up by the hair cells. So now you've got a, a mechanical action being transduced again into hydraulic fluid motion. And then that hydraulic fluid motion is transduced or changed into electrical current by the hair cells, and it sends it to the brain. So here you go. Sound waves transduced into mechanical energy, mechanical energy transduced into hydraulic wave energy, and then hydraulic wave energy transduced by the hair cells into electricity, and that goes to the brain. So you have a series of transducers taking place in the brain. Now, again, I'm, I'm always having a little diff. There we go. I can get to my good old word again. So function of the middle ear to change sound into mechanical energy and send those on to the inner ear. The middle ear also increases sound pressure so it can activate the inner ear. So let's look at that for a second because that's a trip and a half too. Okay. Look at how much bigger this is from this. Look at how much bigger this is compared to here. Look at how much bigger this is compared to here. So you're seeing it three times. The size of the drum compared to the foot plate of the stapes. Size of drum compared to foot plate of stapes. Size of drum compared to foot plate of stapes. Size of drum compared to foot plate of stapes. Why am I always showing you that? Just to bug you, that's why. Whoops, I don't want that. I want to. Oh, let's see. Where can I get a stop sharing? Just got to figure out how to make this thing work here because I, I want you to be able to see my face here and I'm unable to do that right now. Ah, there we go. Perfect. All right, here we go. So now I want you to do a little exercise with me. Take your hand. I'll make the screen bigger. So take your hand and push it against the side of your face. And now push really hard. One, two, three. Okay, stop. Now take your finger and push it really hard against your face. Hurts, doesn't it? This doesn't hurt. This does. That's why you have a middle ear. Because your eardrum is way bigger than the stapes. So if you're laying on your back watching TV with your arms back watching TV and I walk, I'm your roommate and I walk and I put a big brick on your tummy, you're going to say, oof, get that off of me. But if I have a nail on the end of that brick and put it on your tummy, you're dead. Okay? Pressure is force over an area. So a force over a big area, not much pressure. The same force over a little area, lots of pressure. Now, why do you need that? Because your inner ear is filled with fluid. So if you have your head under a swimming pool, your head is underwater, and I'm standing at the edge of the pool talking to you, you're not going to hear me. So how can I make airborne sound activate a fluid-filled cochlea? I've got to increase the pressure of the sound waves. And that middle ear is exactly what does that. It increases the pressure, hitting the drum, now it's squeezed onto the foot plate of the stapes that enters into the cochlea. So now I can activate a fluid-filled cochlea with airborne sound. So if we go back now 
and share a screen and look at our pictures. Okay, look at your PowerPoint slide here. You now can see the purpose of your middle ear. Okay, it increases the pressure of sound so you can activate a fluid filled cochlea. Back to our notes now. So, what happens if you have no middle ears? You'll get a conductive hearing loss again, just like you will if with wax in the outer ear, because you're blocking the conduction of sound getting to the inner ear. Okay? Anyway, conductive hearing loss is most common in children, because in children, the eustachian tubes are more horizontal. In children, the faces are smaller. Adults have longer faces than children do. So children have more horizontal eustachian tubes going from their throat to their middle ears. So infection, th sore throat infection, tonsillitis, infection can more easily get to a child's middle ears than in an adult. That's why adults tend to grow out of earaches. So earaches are middle ear infections. Earaches are often called otitis, oto is ear, itis is inflammation, media, middle, middle ear infection, otitis media, the most common pathology of middle ears. If you get to the inner ear here, the cochlea and vestibular system, this is where it's all at with hearing, everything. The cochlea, hearing, vestibular system, balance. Now, each has different labyrinths, and that's why I showed you here, okay, I showed you here the, 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 the labyrinths, and if I pull this up here and make it larger, okay, there's your one labyrinth, another labyrinth, this labyrinth. You have different coils in the cochlea, different coils. So this is called your bony labyrinth. It has cerebral spinal fluid, and this is called your membranous labyrinth. Bony labyrinths, membranous labyrinth, okay? So there's opposite fluids, as we said, in those. The osseous labyrinth is filled with paralymph. It's a type of fluid. We'll have lots of time to talk about this. Don't freak, F-N-O, freak not out, okay? All I'm saying is this is just an overview. We're going to be going into all of this stuff later on in the course ad nauseum so this is just giving you an overview of where we're going and then there's the membranous labyrinth it's filled with a different kind of fluid and the membranous labyrinth contains 15,000 hair cells and it's not just that all hair cells are equal because they're different you have inner hair cells you have outer hair cells and they do different things the cochlea, or inner ear, is not a one-way street. It's talking to the brain, but the brain's also talking to the cochlea, okay? Everything in your body's like that. Things are not one-way streets, okay? So inner hair cells send information to the brain. Outer hair cells take info from the brain. Enough on that for now. No more need to go any further. The function of the inner ear, it changes mechanical energy into hydraulic energy and then into electrical energy and sends this on to the eighth nerve. Electricity is the language the brain understands. What happens if you've got no inner ears? Ear death. Okay? So conductive hearing loss causes hearing loss. Hair cells damage causes sensory neural hearing loss. Okay, so your hearing loss might be conductive, might be sensory neural, but if you've got no hair cells, no cochleas, you're deaf. Sensory neural, sensory outer hair cell damage due to aging, due to noise exposure, causes mild to moderate sensory neural loss, just like your granny and grandpa have. Typical, typical, typical. This is your everyday hearing loss in elderly people. Trouble hearing treble. Most of your clients will have sensory type of sensory neural. The, the damage is due to outer hair cell pathology. Neural is, more, is, is worse because outer hair cells tend to die before inner hair cells. 
So if now you're getting inner hair cell damage, now you're getting like a severe hearing loss. You need more high power hearing aids and your recognition ability of speech is really diminished because what did we say? Inner hair cells send info to the brain. So with inner hair cell damage, a garbled message is sent to the brain. So now speech sounds very unclear. So two things happen with neural hearing loss. First, the loss is more severe. And secondly, the ability to recognize speech is really impaired, okay? Most common type of sensory neural loss is presbycusis. Circle that word, just like Presbyterian. Presbyterian means church of the elders. Presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to see the page. Presbycusis, high frequency, high hertz, as it says here, trouble hearing treble due to aging. Hits you at about 65 years of age. Presbyopia, can't see stuff close up. Got to hold stuff further away. That hits you at age 40. Presbycusis, age 65. 95% of all hearing loss is presbycusis. This is the main client you will see in your clinic. The second most common cause of sensory neural loss is noise-induced hearing loss. Noise-induced. And the saddest thing about that is it's preventable. <laughs> so we never stare at the sun. You were told during the eclipse that passed through Missouri, don't look at the sun. You're going to go blind, okay? Nobody stares at the sun, but for some reason, people seem to think that the ear is impervious to the ravages of noise, and it ain't, okay? Noise kills hair cells. And what hair cells does it kill? Treble hair cells. So you're getting presbycusis ahead of your time. So if you can hear someone's headphones, and you're not wearing the headphones, the sound's too loud for that person. He or she's going to get noise-induced hearing loss. The eighth cranial nerve, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerve. The hearing and balance pair is the eighth pair. It's a short nerve. It's only an inch long, and they go to the brain stem. And right beside brain stem here, right, spinal cord inside the skull. Spinal cord inside the skull. You have one for each ear. What if you had no eighth nerves? You're deaf because no message can get to your brain. Eighth nerve pathology is often called retrocochlear pathology. It's behind the cochleas. Now, nobody gets damaged to both eighth nerves. What's retrocochlear pathology then? A tumor growing on the eighth nerve. Retrocochlear pathology is almost always one-sided. It hits this ear, or it hits this ear. Presbycusis up here, bilateral. Both ears age the same, okay? They might be a little bit different from each other, but essentially they're gonna be pretty close, all right? When you're talking noise-induced loss, well, that could be very different between the ears. Maybe you're a truck driver and your window's always open on this side, or maybe you're a hunter and it's always this ear that's exposed to the loudness of the gun. Okay, so noise-induced hearing loss can be asymmetrical. Presbycusis is usually symmetrical. Eighth nerve pathology is called retrocochlear pathology, and it's sensory neural loss in one ear. And when you see that, that's a red flag. You need to refer to a physician or to an audiologist. Get that person out of your office. You're not allowed to fit with hearing aids. The person could have a tumor. You need medical permission to fit hearing aids with that person. There we go. Eighth nerve, brain stem damage, often called retrocochlear. It's a benign but pot potentially lethal tumor. It's relatively rare. Only about one in 100,000 people has it. So in Springfield, Missouri, I think is about 150,000 people, maybe 200,000. So maybe one and a half to two people have eighth nerve tumor in Springfield, Missouri. Just so you know, okay? Audiologists do a test called auditory brainstem response. They put electrodes on the head, sounds into the ear, and they're measuring the brain waves. 
And that way they can tell if a person has an eighth nerve tumor. Doctors do CAT scans and MRIs to look for eighth nerve tumors. It's not in your scope of practice. Now, if you're seeing HIP here and not HIS, that's because I'm Canadian. Canadian, we call hearing instrument practitioners. By you, we call you hearing instrument specialists. Same thing. Two-year degree. In Canada, you have to have a two-year diploma or two-year degree to practice. OTC is ahead of its time because in the U.S., you don't need that degree to practice. But you know what? You're getting double the education that most HISs get. Most HISs won't have a foggy clue of half of the knowledge that you are learning. At any rate, central auditory nervous system is your brain, your brain. And we won't go into any, we'll leave that alone for now. Look at a couple of these concepts. We're about done here. I'm going to cut out in about five minutes, okay? Hang on here. Itis, infection. Algia, otalgia means ear pain. Otitis means ear infection. Otoplasty means plastic surgery of the ear. Whenever you see the word Oma, okay, it doesn't mean grandma in Dutch or German, okay, it means Tuma, <laughs> a glastioma, a blastioma, whatever, all these, neuroma, Oma means tumor, osseous means bone, ectomy means surgical removal, good to kind of know these terms because you're going to be reading letters from doctors quite a bit. Again, I've put, put a star by this, conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss. Make sure you know which one is which. This is very quizzable material. Damage to the retina, in quotes, of the ear cannot be medically treated. Like, where have you heard that before? You'd think I wrote these notes, huh? Okay, only hearing aids can help. Hearing aids and sensory neural loss mix like oil and water. Clients are often unhappy with hearing aids because they are poorly counseled as to why. People need realistic expectations about the limitations of hearing aids because fitting eyes versus ears are very different. Eyes is like fitting conductive hearing loss. You're fitting a conductive vision loss. Light isn't properly being conducted to the retina. Okay? Healthy hair cells help to separate speech from background noise. So hearing aids just make sounds louder. They can't separate speech from background noise. Okay, but I want to finish with something here because I'm sharing screen. I want to stop sharing. We'll end the, we'll kind of end this here. You can, well, I'll just read this a little bit. Healthy hair cells separate speech from background noise. Hearing aids aren't hair cells. They're like canes for a bad knee. They help but cannot replace the real McCoy. Hmm. The goal for sensory neural hearing loss is to restore normal loudness growth. Hearing aids need compression because hearing loss does not want all sounds to be made loud. In other words, you want to amplify soft sounds by a lot and loud sounds by little or nothing at all. Now, why am I saying that? I'm going to finish with a picture here, okay? Here's a set of normal hair cells. Whoa, that's a huge picture. Let's go to here. Normal hair cells. Inner, outer. Damaged hair cells. Inner, Outer. Notice that the damage is mostly to the outer hair cells, not as much to the inners. That's why perfect hearing looks like this and impaired hearing looks like this. Even in Chinese, perfect hearing looks like this, impaired hearing looks like this. So these two slides are like verbal analogies of this and this. The weird thing about Hearing loss, if I can just show you here, is this. And I'll show you this. Pay good attention to the slide. Fitting the eye is different from fitting the ear. I shouldn't have an equal sign. This should be a not equal right here. Okay? Make that not equal. Not equal. <laughs> I'll just type that in there. Not the same. Okay, because with vision loss, light isn't properly reaching the retina. Okay, what happens here is 
there's usually not a problem with the middle ear. The problem is inside the cochlea. And you can think of the cochlea as like the retina for the ear. And here's what I was saying. Think of someone with, with hair cell damage, sensory neural loss. Now, here's your decibels from soft to loud. Normal is this line right here, 10 to 20 decibels. You're going to learn all about the decibel in acoustics, but nonetheless, it's very soft. 50 to 60 is comfortable. 90 to 100 sounds too loud. Now sensory neural loss. Now 50 or 60 is soft. And yet 90 to 100 is too loud. Do you see that? It's like the floor went up, but the ceiling didn't. If you're standing up in, on your, in, your, in your room, your, your feet are on the floor and the ceiling's eight feet above you. With sensory neural loss, it's like you standing on the table, and yet the ceiling didn't get any higher. Okay? In other words, loud sounds are going to bug someone with hearing loss just as much as they're going to bug someone with normal hearing. If you walk up to someone who's really hard of hearing and yell in his ear, he's going to wind up and punch you in the head. Okay? It's going to hurt just as bad as it does. The only trouble is he can't hear soft sounds. And that's why I keep saying that hearing aids need to amplify soft sounds by a lot and amplify loud sounds by little or nothing at all. That's why they cost so much. That's why hearing aids cost more than glasses, because they have to constantly change the amount by which they are amplifying. If I speak softly into the hearing aid, it's got to amplify the crap out of the signal. And if I start to talk louder, the hearing aid automatically has to start backing off. Okay, I think basically what we can, we can stop there. Let's be done with this. Let's just don't save. Let's leave that alone. You can see me here, okay? I will blow this up over here so that I can stop recording. We are done, unit one. Overview of the ear. Next week, we'll focus in earnest on the outer ear. And we'll talk all about the pieces and parts. I'll be showing you outer ear canal resonance, all that jazz that we passed over quickly today. Today was simply an overview of the whole ding-dong system. All right, I'll be done. Here's hoping the others who join us can, uh, will enjoy the talk. I'm going to stop recording here and exit stage left. We will see you when we look at you. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.